Great to be with you. We begin with the beginning of the end. State lawmakers head into the final week of session with some big changes on the way. They have only one thing that they really must do, pass a budget, and they will, about $90 billion. But there's also a host of hot button issues on the legislature's agenda, including sanctuary cities, adding conditions for ex-felons to vote, importing drugs from Canada. The House and Senate are jockeying to protect their priorities and to pass their favorite bills. So are the governor and his top lieutenant, Jeanette Nunez. Late this week, we sat down with the lieutenant governor. Lieutenant Governor, great to have you here today. Welcome, welcome home. Thank you. <laughs> great to be here. We are so glad you are. Uh, we want to ask you to sort of explain the process in Tallahassee, the legislative process, <laughs> only a week left yes. in the legislature now. We're really down to the final days, and there are a number of really important bills. So we want to, Glenna and I want to go through some of them, and let's begin with the uh, immigration bill, the Sanctuary Cities bill. Uh, frankly, to a lot of people, this looks like a solution in search of a problem. Why do we need to declare sanctuary cities illegal in Florida since the Department of Justice says we don't have any sanctuary cities? As you know, the legislature is debating any number of bills right now. Getting into the throes of the last week of session is always a challenging time. Um, with regards to sanctuary cities, uh, the Senate and the House have both taken up measures. I know yesterday the Senate had a few um, issues with regards to amendments, and so they're mm -hmm. looking at the process and what will eventually be um, the final version of the bill. Uh, from the governor's perspective, I will tell you he was very clear both on the trail and both in the inauguration in terms of his focus on making sure that when we have individuals that are here illegally and they have committed crimes against residents of our communities. He wants to make sure that we are cooperating with the federal government if there are deportation orders and making sure that those people do not get released into communities, communities like Miami-Dade, communities like Pensacola, and make sure that those individuals aren't reoffending. So that's his perspective and that's his focus. Um, I understand what you're saying in terms yeah. of solution of a problem, uh, but I will tell you that there are problems and we've seen them time and again. The, the public safety aspect of it has been the one aspect that got has gotten the biggest play in the argument for this bill banning sanctuary cities. But in, in a state where one in five people is an immigrant, the way it also plays is people on the streets who are stopped for, for instance, uh, running a stop sign or something benign, that sort of is what we hear is the biggest fear in an immigrant community, taking not the public safety aspect into account, but the humanitarian aspect into account. And you know, for somebody who is from South Florida, the Sanctuary Cities bill and hardline immigration uh, policies as a whole play much differently in South Florida, the immigrant rich community, than it might in the whole state. Well, of course. And, yeah. But I will tell you that there are immig immigrant communities throughout the state, and e even in areas where we wouldn't normally think of them as being heavy immigrant communities. But having um, a unique perspective, both being raised in, in this community where we are obviously a, a community of a lot of immigrants, my parents who came to this country in terms of um, you know, they came in the 60s, they came legally. Uh, we understand that there are a lot of nuances to the issue, but we also understand that we're a nation of laws and we have to respect those laws. I just wanted to point out, we were just looking at video of people in the South Dade fields harvesting. Mm -hmm. um, one of the arguments against sanctuary cities, hardline immigration, is that it will severely impact certain industries in South Florida, like agriculture, like the, the service industry, tourism-based industry that we rely upon, where so many, so much of a percentage of the population who do those kind of jobs are immigrants. Is that an economic concern? Well, the only thing I would tell you is that I have not heard personally um, of late from the chambers or from the business communities with regards to that perspective. Um, that may have played out in the legislative committees, but I have not heard. Oh. Yeah, well, among others, 120 business civic leaders. You've seen the letter that they have sent to uh, Mike Fernandez, Paul Damari, Alex Pinellas, uh, a lot of other, you know, prominent people in our community have said um, agriculture, tourism is going to be very adversely affected. Paul Damari is sort of the tomato king, yes. you know, <laughs> in his district. He, he works just south of your district in Kendall. Uh, what would you say to if Mr. Damari says, hey, I'm not going to have people to pick my tomatoes are going to rot in the fields? 
Well, of course we want to make sure that anything that we do um, from the legislative, the legislative perspective but also from the executive perspective, we're sensitive to the fact that we need to make sure that we're applying policies with regards to growing our economy, making sure that none of our sectors are adversely impacted. But I will tell you, um, the governor has been very clear. We're a nation of laws and he's going to respect those laws. Lieutenant Governor, one of the other big things, especially this week, uh, the state is poised to pass the fifth voucher program for students to obtain money to, to for the families to choose not to go to public school if they want and go to another school. Um, this was covering the governor on the campaign trail. This was one of his big priorities and, and I believe is what he was talking about is to get the waiting lists for the vouchers that stand now to take the kids off the waiting list. However, this latest voucher, the family empowerment voucher, is general fund money whereas some of the other vouchers are either tax credits mm -hmm. or for disability, disabled mm -hmm. children. So do you think, you know, I want to get your take first on the new, newest voucher program and is this, do you think this will pass constitutional muster since, since tax money might mm -hmm. be going toward religious education mm -hmm. in some cases? Well, I, I'm not a constitutional scholar, but I do believe that, that we're in a good position to make sure that this is um, legally appropriate. And, and I will tell you, as you know, that you covered the campaign trail. Uh, again, the governor, then candidate DeSantis, was very clear in his perspective. And he wants to make sure, understanding it myself as, as a mom of three, and, and some of you know my kids, I've had different um, educational experiences for them based on their needs. And I've seen it personally. Um, it doesn't always, it, not one size fits all. And so what we want to do is put the control in the hands of the parents and make sure that we are providing the funding. Um, whether your child goes to a traditional public school, a charter school, or you as a parent choose to take the, those monies and, and go elsewhere, we want to make sure that every child in the state of Florida has access to the best quality education they could possibly get. You know, Lieutenant Governor, several weeks ago, maybe it was right after uh, the, the governor was sworn in, he went to a Seventh-day Adventist school out in West Miami-Dade, a very impressive campus, nice kids, uh, and uh, a, a overtly religious school. And it was in that setting where he talked about the scholarship program. He said 18,000 or so kids cannot get the tax credit scholarships. I guess that, you know, the real question is, the state constitution says that tax money may not be used to subsidize, pay for a religious education. Isn't that what this does? Well, I, I really do think that this is about, again, putting control in the hands of the parents and making sure that everybody has access to the quality education that those parents then decide to employ. And so at the end of the day, what we're looking to do is provide a broad array of options. And so no one is forcing those parents to send their children to a religious school. No one's forcing their parent, those parents to take them out of the public school setting. We're just making sure that the playing field is level, that the playing field has opportunities for parents and students to make the best choice for themselves. So when, when you do that, and that's, you know, that's an argument nobody really would ever argue. Everyone wants choice of where their child is educated. But, but the other side of the balloon when you squeeze it is doesn't that take money out of public schools, the traditional public schools? And, and are all schools public schools, as someone whose name I can't remember said at some point this week? But that's, <laughs> you know, it's not, it's not what you're doing. It's the, it's the ramifications and the consequences and collateral damage that well, and the governor and I both yeah. recognize that, and we recognize that there are a lot of issues, not just with funding public schools, because our focus really is making sure that the students are funded. And so that's why our budget, and that's why both the House and the Senate are looking at increasing allocations to the base student allocation. They're looking at increasing um, teacher pay through a series of mechanisms, one of which is something that the governor was very vocal on, which is the best and brightest scholarship. So that scholarship that's been available has been very restrictive in the past. And so it was based on teachers' SAT and ACT yeah, scores. They're getting rid of that yes, criteria. Yes, so we would be getting rid of that criteria. We would be increasing that amount that is available to effective and highly effective teachers. And so we really want to put forth a platform of education funding that's going to increase the student allocation, the FEFP, that complicated mm -hmm. finance program, um, and also teacher pay, because that's been something very important to both the governor and myself. All right. Just stay where you are. Okay. We're going to come back, take a brief break with Lieutenant Governor Jeanette Nunez in just a minute. We are back talking all things state with Lieutenant Governor Jeanette Nunez, and there's a lot to talk about. One of another one of the governor's biggest uh, campaign promises and, and yours 
was bringing down the cost of prescription drugs by allowing imports from Canada. And boy, has that come to be a big fight, a, a multi-million dollar campaign by Big Pharma and all kinds of companies against it. Um, Lieutenant Governor, is this a scary prospect that would open the door to um, drugs that might be fake or dangerous? It is, does that hold water, that argument? Well, of course not. And, uh, and to your point, I think those are arguments that are used to inject fear into a debate that really should be about driving down the cost of health care. And so the governor and I have, again, been very focused on making sure that we can do the things that we can uh, to bring down that cost. So, you know, when I was in the House, I had a lot of seniors in my district and so those seniors would have to choose between paying their rent paying their light bill or paying for their medications yeah. no senior no Floridian in fact should ever have to make that difficult choice let, let me just drill down a little bit explain the particular detailed process of how you ensure those imported drugs are safe well, first and foremost, there was a federal law that passed uh, decades ago that would have allowed this to take place. And so for many years, we have um, really failed to look at the opportunity to import those drugs from Canada. And so obviously Canada has specific restrictions and very tight standards, similar to what we have here in the United States. And so we would ensure that those standards are met. We would ensure that the process of importing those drugs would be safe, would be effective, and actually would be, bring tremendous savings to Floridians. And this will require approval from the federal government, yeah. HHS, and uh, Governor DeSantis says that President Trump has said, I have, you have my support for that. So Governor DeSantis on many occasions um, has reached out to the administration and really parlayed his relationships from his time serving in Congress to make sure that Florida is uniquely positioned to get increased money for hurricane relief, which we've gotten for the folks in, in Northwest Florida, to get yeah. increased funding for other opportunities. So I'm sure he'll yeah. use his yeah, well, um, cloud to, to do that. Yeah. <laughs> good to have the president as a friend, yes. uh, Lieutenant Governor, let's talk a little bit a, a little bit about the Miami-Dade Expressway Authority (MDX2). Of uh, the uh, state legislators from Miami-Dade, Representative Brian Avila and Senator Manny Diaz, introduced this bill, which you have supported, which would do away with MDX. Uh, why do you think it's a good idea to dissolve MDX and replace it with another agency? Again, going back to my time in the House, probably stemming back from the toll increases that they did in 2014, which were onerous and exorbitant. Um, so I had been working on a number of reforms for MDX, both on the governance and ethics side, to really toll reduction and relief for Floridians. And so uh, I think what you see here is the culmination of a uh, many years level of frustration mm -hmm. with MDX being tone deaf, arrogant, and ignorant to the to the plight of individuals traversing their expressway authorities. And so the legislation crafted by both Representative Avila and Senator Diaz contemplates bringing reform, real reform, that will not, not just be about the governance of the, of the agency, because you can rename it whatever you want. Right. It's about really putting in guardrails to provide relief, to provide yeah. some clarity around what uh, Floridians will experience when they get on a toll road. And Miami-Dade Mayor Carlos Jimenez is livid about this and he says among other things when you go to the bond ratings agencies they are going to raise the interest on these huge amounts of money millions and millions of dollars that are issued for road construction and repair in the MDX the five highways and the toll system. Uh, what's your response to the mayor? Well, Mayor Jimenez has been chair of MDX for, I think, a couple of years and, and has really, they, they refuse to comply with state law to begin with. And they've never taken an approach. How so? How so? Well, because we passed a law a couple of years ago to require toll reductions in the amount of up to 10%, anywhere between 5 and 10%. And so they systematically thumbed their nose at the legislature. They refused to implement the toll reduction that Floridians so desperately needed. And they continued to use red herrings as the issue with the bond covenants. Well, yeah. I spoke with our uh, bond director at and the state level. Level. When we passed that legislation, he said they can absolutely implement this toll relief and not have it affect their bonds. Yeah. Now, all of a sudden, at the 11th hour, with this bill coming down to probably final passage in the next uh, couple of days, I think now they're trying to raise an issue. Um, I don't. Where were they a couple of years ago? I think the bottom line for drivers is you're going to be paying tolls and there will be traffic no matter what. <laughs> Re really quick, we have just a, a little bit of time left. Uh, Sheriff Scott Israel failed in the courts to regain his position. Uh, now for him and also Okaloosa, uh, Okaloosa County's school superintendent Mary Beth Jackson, who are both suspended by the governor, 
uh, should have Senate hearings. I know the governor, Michael, covered the governor this week who said he definitely deserves it, but there's only five days left. Yeah. Uh, might there be a special session called by the governor to to address Scott Israel and Mary Beth Jackson? Well, I don't know if we'll call a special session to, to address that. Um, obviously, we'll review it and see what authority we have to do so for that particular um, case. But, you know, we're, we're eager for the Senate to take action. You think it'll happen um, this week? I, I don't know. Anything could happen. I, I, know, I know enough to know that anything can happen in the final week of session. <laughs> um, but I will tell you that I've spoken to the Parkland parents on multiple occasions, and they were thrilled with the governor's action. And I think they're eager for this situation to be put to rest. And so I'm hopeful that they'll take it up, um, but we'll see. Lieutenant Governor Jeanette Nunez, always a pleasure to have you. Also, we should say Agreed. as we leave that, uh, in fact, texting while driving will become a standalone offense in the state of Florida. It's probably a good thing. Probably, yes, especially <laughs> as a mom of teenagers. <laughs> Amen to that. Okay. All right. Thank you for being with us and uh, stay with us. We'll be back with the roundtable.